Okay. Let's continue our seminar. And it's a pleasure for me to present the second speaker. It's uh, João Fernando Schwartz from the uh, Institute of Mathematics and Statistics of uh, Sao Paulo University. He will speak on Poisson directional equivalence and some other things. Uh, please, please, uh, João, you can start. Okay, uh, it's everything okay? Everyone can see everything? Well, okay. So I can, I can listen. And the, the slides, they are, they are okay? I think so. Ah, okay, so, well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to present here uh, uh, among such a, a distinguished colleagues. And uh, I would lo I would like us to uh, uh, thank the idealizers of the idea of this uh, web seminar because despite being uh, physically apart because of this pandemic, uh, we can still share our mathematical ideas. And uh, it's good that the talking preceding mine was about Poisson algebra, so uh, you are already in the mood to what will follow. Uh, I will, and before I begin, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Ivan Shestakov, Professor Vyacheslav Futorny, and Professor Farko Deshmatov for uh, the discussions and suggestions that contributed to the development of this work, and also to Xiaozhu Shen and all staff uh, from uh, Sichuan University in Chengdu, China, where most of this work was done. So uh, what I will talk about, well, it's a kind of a refinement of the notion of Brushno equivalence, namely Poisson Brushno equivalence, and as a main application, uh, column branches of 3D and C equal to 4 supersymmetric gauge theories. So I will start from the very beginning. So uh, remember that uh, in the category of affine varieties, we have the usual uh, algebra geometry dictionary. So here, two varieties are isomorphic, if and only if the rings of flagrant functions are isomorphic. They are Brushno equivalent, if and only if their functional fields are isomorphic. The functional field is, not, is nothing more than the uh, field of fractions of the ring of regular functions. And moreover, uh, they are stably Brushno equivalent if x times a certain power of a makes it, uh, of the fine space, uh, makes uh, it Brushno to y. In, in case y itself is the fine space, we say in here that x is a rational variety and here that it's a stably rational variety. There are other notions of rationality which are interesting, but uh, they will not appear in the stock. So we can uh, move to a different category, the category of a fine Poisson varieties. Uh, Poisson variety is one in which its ring of regular functions has uh, the structure of Poisson algebra. And moreover, uh, the morphisms are, uh, does not preserve, uh, don't, doesn't preserve only the commutative algebra structure. They also preserve the Poisson bracket. And so in this category, two varieties are isomorphic if the rings of regular, regular functions are isomorphic as Poisson algebras. And you have the notion of Poisson variational equivalent in case their functional fields are isomorphic as Poisson fields. Uh, the, this, uh, the quotient field, of course, naturally inherits uh, the Poisson bracket via localization. Uh, what was called in previous talk uh, symplectic Poisson algebra, I will call uh, the standard Poisson algebra. It's the usual construction uh, on the symmetric algebra of symplectic vector space with non-degenerate form. And I will denote the standard Poisson algebra by S and K. And I will denote its uh, Poisson field of fractions, K and K, like this, and denote it the standard Poisson field. 
the main question of the stock is the following. So let X and Y be two Poisson varieties. When are they Poisson Brochno equivalent? In case the functional field is a uh, standard Poisson field, you say that variety is Poisson rational. In particular, a Poisson rational variety is clearly rational. Uh, there is also uh, another, uh, in the non commutative setting, we can also talk about uh, non commutative rational equivalence. Uh, it will be very simple here. We'll say that two R domains, A, A and B, such that the division rings of fractions are isomorphic, are called non necessarily uh, rational equivalent. And write like this for this situation. We are interested in cases of Poisson Brachian equivalence that are quasi classical limit, what in the previous call, uh, talk was called a semi classical limit, uh, analogs of problems of non commutative Brachian equivalence. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, the first problem in this line of inquiry is due to Gilfan and Kirillov in their remarkable paper of 1966. Uh, this is indeed a rather remarkable paper. Uh, many things uh, common to ring theorists uh, first appeared in this paper. Of course, the notion of gilfan kirillov dimension, uh, the gilfan kirillov transcendence degree, and what is important for us, the gilfan kirillov conjecture. So what is the gilfan kirillov conjecture? It's a rather bold statement about the possible rational equivalence classes of enveloping algebras of algebraically algebras. Uh, the conjecture uh, says that uh, the canonical elements in these Brachian equivalence classes are certain vial fields of a vial algebra over a purely transcendental extension of the base field. And I say that this is a bold conjecture because uh, there is a lot of uh, different structure up to isomorphism between these enveloping algebras, but uh, these, these vial fields are determined up to isomorphism by just two non negative integers. N and S. And before I move to the to the next slide, I will remark that uh, Gilfan Kirillov conjecture was very influential in the development of Lie theory and attract the attention of a lot of uh, distinguished mathematicians, as we will see. It also became kind of a paradigmatic approach to questions of classification up to rational equivalence of uh, division rings of Noetherian or domains. And it appears, for instance, uh, in the work of Ettingoff and Ginzburg on symplectic reflection algebras, and in the work uh, of Futorni and of Zienko on uh, Galois algebras, which are important in representation theory. And more recently, in beginning in the early 90s, in the theory of quantum groups, there was, uh, it was introduced uh, quantized version of the gilfan kirillov conjecture, and it's an area of study uh, much considered up to this day. So about the gilfan kirillov conjecture itself, it was shown to be true for types A, for nipotent Lie algebras. Now we have uh, one of these uh, nice cases in mathematics where a result is proved simultaneously by different groups of people uh, at the same time, here uh, three groups of people, six in total, the case of solvable Lie algebras in 1973. However, the Gelfand Kirillov conjecture is false in general. Uh, Alev, Ohms, and Van der Berg construct a series of counterexamples. And at this point, you might ask uh, why uh, I keep calling it the Gelfand Kirillov conjecture, or at least it is so, sometimes also uh, called in the literature as a uh, Gelfand Kirillov hypothesis. Well, the reason is because of its influence in this kind of study, uh, as I just said. So it's by the weight of tradition. It's true for the algebras of small dimension, and in fact, the least, uh, least dimension where you can have a counterexample for Gelfon Kirov conjecture is nine. And in 2010, the case of uh, simple Lie algebras was revisited by Premet who show it's false for types B, D, F, and E. And it remains an open problem for enveloping algebras of Lie algebras of type C and G. And a very hard and difficult open problem. Uh, there is nothing known about the division ring 
of fractions of these algebras. We are interested in another version of non commutative of uh, non commutative rational equivalence which is non computative in this problem. But uh, before I introduce it, of course, I have to talk about uh, the original Nether problem. It was introduced by Amy Nether shortly after uh, she obtained her German equivalent of PhD. And the question posed by Nether problem is the following. So uh, let G be a finite group acting linearly on the field of fractional functions. When is its invariant subfield itself uh, field of fractional functions, or in the uh, geometric terminology I discussed, when is the quotient of this variety rational? Well, uh, non cooperative this problem was first in an uh, exploratory way considered by Jacques Alev and François Dumas in 1998, and later formally introduced in 2006. And the question is, for G a finite group acting linearly on the Weyl algebra, when is it uh, non commutative? Uh, it, it is non commutative, its invariance is non commutative rational equivalent to the Weyl algebra itself? Well, uh, there is a question that logically comes first here, and it is uh, why I'm asking about uh, rational equivalence not uh, isomorphism between the invariants of the Weyl algebra and the Weyl algebra itself. Well, the explanation for this is because we can never have uh, an isomorphism between the invariants of the Weyl algebra and the Weyl algebra itself. Uh, this was shown by Alevin Polo in 1995. And in fact, uh, it is uh, a stronger statement holds. The Weyl algebra is not the fixed ring of any non commutative domain under the action of a finite group with no trivial action. And given this, it's even more remarkable that uh, when we go to the level of the division ring of fractions, a lot of isomorphisms can happen. So, a uh, little bit of uh, history on non commutativeness problem. It's true when n is equal to 1 and 2. This was considered by Jacques Alev and Francois Dumas. And it's true also for algebraically closed fields when g is abelian. And later it was shown to be true for the permutation action of the symmetric group for algebraically closed fields, work of Futorni, Molev, and of Zienko. And this uh, shows an interesting connection between. Uh, uh, non computative in this problem and the Gelfand Kirillov conjecture for uh, this result allows us to obtain, via the theory of Galois algebras, a uh, novel proof for the Gelfand Kirillov conjecture for GLN. Uh, next, uh, in 2017, uh, together with Eshmatov, Futorni, and Ovzienko, we showed that this is true whenever the base field is the complex number and G is a complex reflection group. And as a consequence, we have the uh, very simple proof of the Gelfand Kirillov conjecture for spherical subalgebras of rational Schrödinger algebras when the complex parameter T is different from zero. A uh, continuation of this work uh, is uh, work together with Professor Futorni, where we show that uh, in what can be said in more clear way that uh, and concise way that if you have a G a finite group acting linearly, then a positive solution of another problems implies a positive solution of non commutative another problem. And building uh, now uh, uh, as you note, uh, all these algebras are quantizations or filtered quantizations of Poisson algebras. The enveloping algebra is the quantization of the symmetric algebra on G with constant Kirillov bracket. The Weyl algebra and its invariants are filtered quantizations of the standard Poisson algebra and its invariant when G is a finite group acting linearly. 
the spherical subalgebra when of a rational algebra when t is equal to zero is has also a quantization uh, a rational algebra when t is a formal parameter and when you have an smooth affine variety and g a finite group of automorphisms and uh, the ring of different operators and its invariants are filtered quantizations of the constant bundle and its invariants. So uh, the kind of question of poisson rational equivalence we are interested are uh, quasi-classical analogous of uh, questions of non-computative rational equivalence. Uh, for instance, we have a Poisson analog of Gilfan Kirillov conjecture. When is the field of fractions of the standard uh, of the symmetric algebra on G with constant Kirillov bracket isomorphic to the Poisson field of fractions of uh, the standard Poisson algebra over pro transcendental extension of the base field? This is a very old question going back to 19. 72, just six years after the introduction of the gilfan kirillov conjecture. And it was shown to be true for nilpotent algebras. Later, in similarity with the original gilfan kirillov conjecture, it was shown to be true for algebraic solvable G. And finally, uh, it was shown to be, uh, uh, well, it's not true always if G is not algebraic, for instance. We also have versions for the classical, classical limits of certain quantum groups related to the quantum gilfan kirillov conjecture. And well, an example of the kind of questions we are interested. Uh, our original contribution is a quasi classical limit of non commutative another's problem, namely Poisson another's problem considered by Jules Baldry, a student of Jacques Alev. And the question is as follows. Let G be a finite group of symplectomorphisms or symplectoisomorphisms of the standard Poisson algebra. When is the invariant of the standard Poisson field isomorphic to the Poisson field itself? Well, it was shown to be true when gamma, for gamma finite subgroups of SL2, with an explicit description of the invariants. And uh, what I mean by this, we can find uh, invariant elements on the standard Poisson field that explicitly shows this isomorphism to hold. Uh, Dumas also contributed in this direction. He showed uh, the same thing for G abelian and when the base fields are directly closed with an explicit description. And retroactively, a uh, result of Gordon uh, in, an, an, uh, in an unpublished manuscript shows that, uh, in fact, a more general version of Baldry's result is true uh, for the actions of the so called rest product type groups, uh, rest products of a finite subgroup of SL2 and the symmetric group. Uh, however, there are two questions on Gordon's uh, way of thinking that are not suitable for us. The first of them is that uh, he showed these isomorphisms to hold in a non explicit fashion. And we want to be constructive as this is an important aspect of invariant theory. And also uh, his approach he used uh, symplectic resolutions of singularities. And these are in general not available for the kind of group actions which, are, which we are going to consider. For the rest of my talk, uh, the base field will be the complex number. Uh, I will introduce the notion of a uh, symplectic reflection group. These are the symplectic analogs of the usual notion of complex reflection groups. So we have a complex vector space with a non-degenerate skew symmetric form. And the symplectic reflection group is a finite subgroup of symplectic isomorphisms generated by symplectic reflections. That is, elements such that the identity minus this element has rank, well, not equals to one, in the, like the case of complex 
reflections because it's impossible, but the second best situation when the rank is equal to two. We call the above data simplex triple and denote it like this. And uh, to simplify the study of symplectic triples, uh, we consider just the indecomposable ones. These are the ones where V cannot be split as a non-trivial direct sum of gamma invariant subspaces. And the composable symplectic triples are classified, and they are essentially, with a, num of, with a finite number of exceptions, one of the following. The first one is uh, arise from a complex representation of a com finite complex reflection group. And uh, we obtain a simplex reflection group in the following way. We consider V the direct sum of the complex representation and its dual. This vector space has a natural simplex form. And the diagonal action of W turns it into a simplex reflection group with the set of complex reflections now being the set of simplex reflections. The other important family of in the composable triples is given by the rest product case in action of C to the power 2n. And our first main result is the following. So uh, let W be a complex reflection group acting on V uh, in the way I outlined in the previous slide. Uh, so it becomes a simple reflection group. We can consider its action on the standard Poisson algebra and hence on the standard Poisson field. Poisson negative problem has a positive solution for this action. And here is where uh, Simplex resolutions of singularities fail us because uh, complex reflection groups can be decomposed into its irreducible pieces. And except when, uh, for irreducible complex reflection groups, with the exception of the, the cyclotomic ones and one of the 34 uh, exceptional cases, there are no simplex resolutions of singularities. And our approach has an uh, advantage which is uh, we can, uh, for G, either arising for a complex reflection group or of rest product type, we have an explicit isomorphism between the invariants of the standard Poisson field and the Poisson field itself. And moreover, uh, this isomorphism is computable. What I mean by this, uh, if you have uh, the action vector space, we have an algorithm with fairly modest computational cost that uh, shows uh, the generators here that realizes this isomorphism. Now, a question that naturally arises is the following. So let gamma be a finite, uh, any simple reflection group acting on a simple vector space, and we can consider its action induced on the standard Poisson algebra as before, and hence on the standard Poisson field. Uh, the question is, does Poisson the problem has a positive solution? And this is an intriguing question because uh, our approach uh, for the cases where we have positive solution is uh, distant from being conceptual. And it would be nice to have an approach with used only uh, abstract geometrical properties of symplectic reflection groups, which is an area of intensive study in these days. And it would be very nice if a uh, Poisson analog of the classical result of another problem for complex reflection groups hold for simple reflection groups. And now a remark, uh, another problem holds for complex reflection groups because we have the schiffele schiffer todd theorem. But uh, an analog of schiffele schiffer todd theorem for the standard Poisson algebra is impossible. So we necessarily have to consider localizations in order to obtain any kind of result. Uh, we have an immediate application of this, which is in the theory of kalogeron moser spaces. Well, the original kalogeron moser space is a smooth complex simplet variety obtained in the context of classical integrable system studied by instance, by Kasdan, Constant, and Stenberg, uh, introduced by Kasdan, Constant, and Stenberg, and later studied by many authors and shown to be 
connected to many areas of mathematics. Fourier algebraically, it's the following categorical quotient. And so, uh, intuitively, it's uh, the classification space of pair of matrices whose uh, rank of the commutator plus the identity is equal to one. In 2002, in their seminal work on simplex reflection algebras, Ettinghoff and Ginzburg introduced rational Schrödinger algebras, uh, which depends on three things, a complex parameter T, another parameter C, which will not be important for us, and a complex reflection group. They are denoted like this. When T is different from zero, their center is just the scalars, but when the center, when T is equal to zero, this, their center is big. And the spectrum of the center is what's called a generalized Klobuchar-Muller space. There are many good reasons for it to receive this name. And in particular, when we have W, the symmetric group with the permutation representation, uh, this variety is just this one, as was shown by Ettinghoff and Ginzburg. Uh, we have work of Ettinghoff Ginzburg on these varieties. Well, first, that uh, the center of the rational Schrödinger algebra at the level t is equal to zero is isomorphic to the spherical subalgebra when t is equal to zero. And so in particular, the uh, generalized Calgary-Muller spaces are Poisson varieties. And moreover, their Poisson function fields are isomorphic to invariants of the standard Poisson field under the action of the corresponding complex reflection group. And so uh, this is exactly what we considered before. So we have that all generalized Calgary-Muller spaces are Poisson rational. And philosophically, this is uh, the classical Classical, uh, this is the classical, classical, uh, quasi classical limit, analog of a reasoning for the Gilfan Kirov conjecture for uh, rational Friedrich algebras, which I mentioned before. And as we notice, we have uh, good results for Poisson rational equivalence in the class, quasi classical limit of Gilfan Kirov conjecture and non commutative in this problem. So the idea was to see whether other notions of non-competitive rational equivalence would give interesting results in the quasi-classical limit. In our work with Futorni, we considered a natural generalization of non-competitive Nader's problem and obtained the following. So if X is an irreducible variety and G is a finite group acting on it by automorphisms, such that the quotient of X by G is rational to Y, then y is and y is also fine. Then we have that uh, the ring, the invariant rings of differential operators on X are non-competitive rational equivalents to the rings of differential operators on Y. And so the idea was to see what happens in the classical quasi-classical limit. So the quasi-classical quasi -classical limit is the cotangent bundle. And of course, for uh, this previous result, uh, uh, surprisingly, we don't need any hypothesis on the varieties such as being smooth or normal for this to, roll, to, to hold. But uh, to, consider, to say anything on the quasi-classical limit, of course, we need that X be smooth. So uh, we want to see if in the quasi-classical limit, uh, we would obtain a similar result, and the answer was yes. If X is an smooth affine variety, and G is a finite group acting on it, uh, such that the quotient is rational to Y for a certain smooth affine Y, then we have a Poisson rational equivalence between the quotient of the contingent bundle on X by the contingent bundle on Y. Uh, Professor Fakod uh, suggested uh, to consider the reverse implication, and in the case of uh, smooth affine curves, uh, we have the reverse implication. If two curves uh, have cotogen bundles Poisson rational equivalent, then they are rational equivalent. Uh, the explanation for this fact is essentially that for uh, functional fields with transcendence degree one, uh, stably 
rational equivalence and rational equivalence are the same thing. Now, we have an important, uh, very important question in ring theory. Let X and Y be two affine varieties. If the rings of differential operators are isomorphic or are they modita equivalent, what can you say about the relation between X and Y? This is a much studied question and there are a lot of interesting results. And what we had is a certain uh, rational version of these considerations because as we saw, if X and Y are rational equivalent, then so are the rings of differential operators and their cotogen bundles. And suppose we have this or this, what can we deduce about the relation between X and Y? We saw that in the case of curves, this implies that these are rational equivalent, but in general, uh, almost nothing is known about this uh, situation. Now, finally, I would like to discuss uh, Coulomb branches of 3D n equals to four supersymmetric gauge theories. Now, I will not try to give you a physical background on the subject because uh, I don't feel uh, like I have the proper physical background myself. So I would just give you some references. We have the work of Nakajima. Well, what is a column branch to begin with? It's an affine variety, which has been considered by uh, people working in mathematical physics for a time, but it did not have a precise mathematical definition. Uh, the first step in the math rigorous mathematical definition was done by Nakajima in this paper, and I recommend it for a very high level uh, discussion of the relevant physics in the introduction of these objects. A more leisure introduction uh, to this theory, which is highly technical, I must say, is this survey by Nakajima. Here he discusses physical motivation, also at a high level, but uh, more accessible. And it discusses uh, many aspects of the very technical definition of a column branch. And for people who want to understand the subject beginning from scratch, there is the Clay Mathematical Institute book on mirror symmetry. It's good either for mathematicians with few background in physics or physicists with few background in mathematics. What is mathematically a column branch? It's a recipe to obtain a normal, a normal Poisson variety given the date of G a complex reductive algebraic group and M a simplex representation of cotogen type. Uh, the curious thing about the definition of a column branch is that it's uh, highly uh, indirect. So how we obtain the column branch? Uh, first, we consider a certain end scheme related with the affining Grassmannian. We consider the equivariant bottle Moore homology on it, and we, and, uh, with a lot of technical effort, uh, is introduced a convolution product. And in complex and uh, geometric representation theory, convolution products have been used a lot recently but uh, usually the algebras they generate are not commutative. But in this case, the remarkable fact is that the product is commutative. And in fact, these uh, column branches are normal integral, uh, are normal Poisson varieties as we are going to see. And another remarkable fact is that the ring of ergon functions comes naturally with a quantization. We just add an extra loop parameter in the bottom row homology and consider the same definition of convolution product. The important theorem for us is due to Braverman, Fickenberg, and Nakajima, and it is the following. So let's uh, consider a column branch with, uh, given by G and M. Let H be a maximal total of G and W its value group. Then the column branch is Poisson rational equivalent to the cotangent bundle of the quotient of the dual of H 
to uh, the action of W. In particular, the Poisson Brochnow equivalence class does not depend on M, which is already an interesting result. But about this uh, right hand side term here, it's exact of the exact nature of uh, quaternion bundles we have discussed previously. So the result, which came as a, as a surprise for me, is that every column, column branch is Poisson rational, namely, if the rank of the maximal torus is n, then its function field is isomorphic as Poisson field to this standard Poisson field. And I finished the talk with the following question. So uh, we have seen many cases of two domains which are filtered or not quantizations of certain Poisson algebras, such that they are non commutative rational equivalent, and the algebras they quantize have isomorphic Poisson field of, of uh, Poisson fields of fractions. So what is, let's say, philosophical reason for that? What I mean precisely? Uh, is there some hidden pattern in all these cases where this happens and this happens, which we have discussed? I would like also to mention that there are another cases of this situation which uh, didn't appear in the slides, but this is quite a common phenomenon. So I think it would be interesting to understand uh, uh, how those two things are related and also what about the converse because uh, the converse would be to understand uh, quantizations of algebras if we, of their division rings of fractions, if we understand the ring of fractions of the algebras they quantize. And this is interesting because of our interest in the gelfand kirill of conjecture. Uh, the quantized column branches uh, have a very difficult description in general. And so uh, an approach to understand them better would understand their uh, brush no equivalence classes. And it was shown recently by Ben Webster, all of them of are Galois algebras. And one thing about Galois algebras is that they are general, they generally satisfy either the Gilfan field of conjecture and their quantized version. And in any way, even if uh, the Gelfman Kirov conjecture fails. The theory of Galois algebras gives us a material to have a more concrete understanding of the division rings of fractions of an R domain. And so the study of their division rings of fractions seems a very interesting question. And well, with this, I end my talk and I thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions to the speaker? I have a what? question. Uh, so you mentioned several positive results in your talk, uh, giving examples of uh, Poisson rational things. Uh, do you expect uh -huh. to have in future some uh, negative results, so to speak, some counter examples? Uh, when your object is not uh, Poisson rational or something like that? If yes, uh, can you think about some, so to speak, rational Poisson invariance that could help in detecting non-rationality? So, uh, about uh, no, well, uh... One thing we could consider is the Poisson center of the Poisson function field. Uh, it must be either uh, the scalars or a uh, pre transcendental extension of the base field. But in fact, this uh, line of inquiry is quite recent and uh, there are not uh, many invariants or uh, I don't know uh, invariants to distinguish them in general. Uh, perhaps, I mean, uh, for, uh, for 
uh, vial fields and uh, quantized vial fields, there are invariants to, to distinguish them. So perhaps a similarly motivated definition could work. But uh, this, is a, this is a very trick issue. OK, thank you. OK, more questions? OK, I, I have something to say. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yes. OK, OK. OK, great. OK, so there is something which could be invariant, but it's not clear whether it is invariant. It's invariant in similar situations when you deal with algebras. It's not clear about uh, skew fields. So here what you do, you typically in this situation can take a set of generators and relations and then switch to finite characteristic. Now, okay. when you look at it in finite characteristic, instead of infinite dimensional skew field over the center, you're getting finite dimension over the center. Yes. Then you can look at this dimension. This dimension depends in some regular way on prime number by which you factorized. Yeah? Yes. And this grows could be an invariant. Now, and there is some, I, well, once upon a time, it was many years ago, Tony Joseph gave me an example of a skew field, and he was interested why it is not isomorphic, as he said, to uh, the standard, uh, what, what is called DNK or whatever it's called now in English, I don't, well, fields of fractions or biologics. So this kind of helped to see why it is not the case. But there is a big problem. In algebra context, this growth doesn't depend on set of generators. In skew field context, it's not clear whether it's depend or not. So anyway, I asked several people, I was too lazy, uh, several people to think about it, and they didn't succeed. So that can be some kind of a cute invariant. Uh, did you? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. I got what you are saying, and yes, yeah. yes. Uh, some people have used this kind of reasoning. Uh, for instance, in Premet, when he showed that the Gelfand mm -hmm. field of conjecture fails for the simple algebra I mentioned, he reduced model prime, and then he, yeah, this idea works at least in one case. So I think it's a good idea. Yes. Okay, so just to bring it to your attention, because, you know, I, I'm not okay. doing it for, it was probably, I don't know, 40 years ago, he asked me. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, thank you, it's a great suggestion. Sure. Some more questions? More questions? No more questions, so let us, thanks, John, again. Yeah. In a week, in a week, we will have a talk by Mark Rosso from France. And I just want to remember you just if that uh, on our page we have some all previous lectures. Uh, you can listen and they are how to say recorded. Previous lectures are recorded, so you can you can see them. So bye bye. See you in a week. Bye bye. Goodbye, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.